Adu. She is the convener of the South African BDS Coalition. She has previously worked for migrant rights um, in NGO spaces as well as for DERCO, uh, where she served in the Middle East section and, and as a political counselor at the South African Embassy in Algiers. Prior to this, Roshan grew up in exile and was an anti apartheid um, activist movement uh, and was part of the anti apartheid movement and the PSC in the UK. Um, just as a side note, Roshan is very cool and inspiring in her current activism as well. Um, secondly, we have Noor Ahmed. Noor is a feminist and an intersectional youth activist focusing on feminist, humanitarian and social justice issues. She's currently working towards her master's in psychology at BITS, where she was also involved in various societies and leadership structures. She has always been involved in activism and advocacy spaces, starting off by advocating for mental health and working towards eradicating the stigma around it. And this helped her see the value of taking action and using her voice uh, to speak out against issues and injustices which prevail um, society. Thanks so much for joining us, Noor. Um, then we have Ms. Kamalita Naika. She holds um, a master's degree in political science from the Rhodes University, where she was a research student at the Unit for Humanities at Rhodes, also known as Uhuru. Um, she's currently working towards her PhD, focusing on the afterlives of Americana in South African popular politics, and she lectures at UCT. Thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Naika. And lastly, we have Samiha joining us from Palestine. Unfortunately, because she is in a settlement area, there have been some internet connections. Hopefully she will be able to join us later on um, in the conversation. But thanks so much for joining us. Um, right, so just to contextualize why we as the SUPSF thought that this event was important, it's because women are often the backbone and driving force of liberation and social movements but their roles are either erased completely or just undermined. I mean, when we think of apartheid in South Africa, we're very quick to jump to names like Nelson Mandela, Albert Lutuli, um, Steve Biko. But if you ask someone like the general South African, can you think of one woman anti-apartheid activist uh, other than Winnie Madigizel Mandela? I think a lot of people would struggle with that. You know, um, people would, not think to say, well, what about Ruth first? What about Vinny and Goyi? And I think that's problematic. And so the space tonight is really to highlight the role that women play in liberation movements, as well as to draw comparatives between how women have contributed to liberation in South Africa and how they are currently contributing to, to the liberation struggle in Palestine. Um, so yes, uh, we're really excited <clears throat> to, to have this conversation. Um, I'd like to start off with uh, Roshan, and Roshan, if you could just kind of contextualize what similarities you think exist um, between the role that women played back in South African apartheid and the role that they're currently playing in Palestinian uh, apartheid. And um, when you kind of talk us through that, could you perhaps talk us through how you think Palestine's instance of settler colonialism perhaps changes the landscapes um, for women in Palestine and why their role may be um, slightly more difficult or slightly different to South Africa's. Thanks very much. Um, <laughs> it's really great that you're having this, this conversation and I feel a bit in awe of the other speakers because I'm not really an expert on women either in our struggle or the Palestinian struggle. I think I just happen to be a woman <laughs> in the struggle <laughs> or having been in solidarity movements both in both cases. Um, but I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I think because both um, Palestine and South Africa are settler colonial and apartheid states and therefore the struggle and the resistance in some ways is quite similar um both for men and women i suppose um the, you know there are there are similarities but i i can't really speak to the particularly palestinian women but in general 
I think one of the one of the similarities is around women in communities because when you're facing forced removals and um, evictions and house demolitions, as in Palestine, it's usually women who are at the forefront of those struggles, being the people that are more likely to be the the ones um, the home makers. Does that sound really old fashioned? Um, and the the ones who are uh, defending homes and communities in that sense. So I think there are similarities, although interestingly, the other day there was a SAJFP webinar on particularly Masafa Yatta, which is where Samiha is uh, hopefully going to speak to us from. And I'm sure we'll have a lot more to say about what's happening there right now in terms of the uh, um, uh, forced removals that are taking place. Um, but one of the points that was made um, when looking in detail, which I had forgotten, in fact, the details of how those sorts of forced removals took place, led Aninka Klaassens, who was giving the talk on forced removals here right up until the present day and the resistance against um, the Bantustan bills, as I call them, or we call them, um, that, are, that one of which has been passed now under the guise of Khoisan uh, and traditional leadership. Um, that in the case of South African forced removals, people were removed from one place to another, however terrible the place they were removed to was. Um, and she noticed and, uh, and made the connection with Palestine saying it's actually worse than apartheid in that sense because people are not given, it's not a question of moving people in order to create Bantustans and create that pool of labour with no rights or land um, ownership within an apartheid white South African state. People are literally just... Um, being ethnically cleansed. And I think that is the difference that I hadn't really associated in that sense. And in that sense, I think it's women that bear the brunt um, of that. But I'll stop there. Uh, I, I think um, that's a very robust answer. And I just want to touch on what you said about how women often have to shoulder the uh, burden of care um, and often of cohesion. Um, and Ms. Naika, I'd like to bring you in here because you recently wrote a journal article titled Unpacking the Role of Women in Community Struggles. Could you perhaps uh, briefly tell us uh, what your findings were and if you could maybe comment on what Roshan said and how often women are the units that keep um, communities together in times of forced displacement, in times of conflict and struggle? Oh, and if possible, please will you put your camera on? Um, sure. Let me try. Uh, okay. Cool. Can you see me? Yes, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> I have a bit of a flu, so <clears throat> excuse okay. me if I cough or I sound nasal. Um, Yes, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm broadly in agreement with what uh, Roshan said, and that, you know, and that article was more looking at, um, yeah, at all of this, you know, what you said about care work, and I think that, you know, beyond care work, and I don't think it's, uh, you know, old fashioned to say homemakers, because I think that, Yes, women's uh, activism and, and women's uh, work still is actually organized around the home. It's organized around food. It's organized around children. Um, and it's organized around uh, everyday life, which I think uh, is the point of these kinds of struggles, whether in forced removals or um, you know, under everyday occupation, um, this is this is what women do. They often in the home, and if you look at places like Palestine, where you know, I mean, of course, women get arrested all the time, but I think men often get arrested more than women. Um, <clears throat> I think that they often left uh, to yeah to maintain the home, to look after children, to make everyday life work, and I think that is where. Um, 
a lot of women's organizational capacity actually comes into play in terms of the networks that they draw and in terms of the um, in terms of the solidarities they are able to provide for each other in terms of all of these things that happen in in communal spaces that are often organized around very everyday concerns and around the home so i think what um you know what what that article was was trying to say was that you know these are some of the things some of the organization some of the work and some of the practices that is not usually captured through organizational histories or organizational bodies or institutional kind of um ways of doing politics i think that there is um all of these things that happen in between and around and within and in conversation with this that isn't quite captured uh, in those forms and that is a lot of what uh, women do i think um i think that's incredibly nuanced because when we think of activism i think a lot of us think uh you go around you do um you attend protests you hold up banners you take on the man um you try to fight the system but i think what you're saying is completely true in that activism actually happens um in much more interpersonal ways so nur i'd like to ask you for your opinion on this because um kind of contrasting what kamlita and roshan said um i think the campus space is changing in that way in that um women are taking up more visible spaces um women are not only taking up positions of power but i think they're more empowered just in airing their voices and opinions and so i'd like to know from you uh in instances where they are in the more glamorized sort of activist positions um do you think that um this is useful do you think that uh like it changes the shapes and narratives of activism Um hello everyone. I am definitely so inspired to be amongst the panel of such amazing women and just hearing both um Russian and Kamalita's inputs. Um I know that I'm going to be learning quite a lot today. Um just in terms of I think the space that women are taking on campus is um there are quite a few uh they are definitely taking on more space and activism in general especially when it comes to university organizations or um grassroots or community level work i think that's where i agree with um kamalita is that women are um definitely organizing and working more in the sort of community space and the grassroots level space um i just wish that it translated more to sort of higher up structures in the country um there has been more representation of women in positions of power but um i guess we have to ask ourselves is that enough so all of the work that's being done in the communities you'll have women who are um working really hard to ensure that communities are safe spaces for other women and for children and you're really taking up issues that a community is affected by but you don't really see these same women sometimes being uh, brought into conversations around issues in that community you know um and they're kind of are generally sometimes excluded from those conversations and this is um a topic or a, a discussion that's been had in the sort of um activism space for um a long time it's about um how why is it that you know women are so involved in all these structures but when it comes to like the major decisions the co-creation of solutions they're not really brought into that space um but i also think we also need to keep in mind that um well that's really important for women to be represented that representation has to be authentic so we can't really applaud a woman being in power or being in a position um of power um when their values do not align with what we stand for so you know we can celebrate for example like the first female president of south africa if they are homophobic or or xenophobic so there needs to be sort of an alignment um of the values that are espoused by that woman yeah cool cool um no i i definitely agree with that especially when like we think of issues like tokenization um when you know people are are represented um so yeah i think you touched on some really interesting points 
Um, I really want to extend a warm welcome to Samiha. Um, thank you so much. You're joining us from Palestine. Um, I just want to make sure that you can hear. Hi. Hi. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, just a little thank bit. Thank you. I'm sorry for my late. I will do my best to be with all of you. I changed my place, guys. You know, I'm living oh, in so. um, South Hebron in between settlements, so it was difficult for me to, to get a good connection, but I, I moved for a good place, so I hope I can be with you the rest of the meeting. That, that's perfect. Thank you. So just for context on Samiha, Samiha is um, an activist and part of the Altivani village in Masafar Yatta. Um, Samiha, if I can kind of throw you in here, um, what we're currently speaking about is women's role in liberation struggles. And from a Palestinian perspective, um, how have you found engaging in the struggle as a woman? And what can you tell us about um, how women activists are treated within the activist space in Palestine from your experience? Uh, so first of all, I'm Samiha, I'm a youth activist in Safariyata South Hebron Hills. Uh, I'm 23 years old. I will uh, mention for you my own experience in the Ramsay Lens resistance so you can have an idea about how we, uh, we deal in our resistance with the Israeli occupation settlers and army in this area. Cool, thanks. Um, can you, if you don't mind, can you share some of those experiences, um, yes, especially as course. a woman? Sure. Um, I start my activism in 2017 with my independence group, uh, Youth of Samud, we called ourselves. Youth of Samud means Youth of Steadfastness. We started this idea in uh, this Palestinian old village called Sarura. It's located between two illegal outposts. Uh, and the idea was in the 90s they kicked out the Palestinian in a really violent way to uh, confiscate this village and use the land of the village to connect to these two illegal outposts together. So it was since more than 22 years and the idea was in 2017 to create this uh, steadfastness camp, like smooth camp, to encourage the families who was evicted in that time to come back and uh, live in the village again to protect it from this plan of the settlers to connect these two illegal outposts together. It was really not easy, uh, like uh, camp or idea that can be happens because we are living here in sea area. Sea area means living under the full control of the Israeli occupation. Uh, so they are controlling everything. Even this village is don't have any life service, like any simple life service. You can say they don't have. They don't have even houses. They they were living in caves. It's natural caves, like it's in the land, because they are not allowed even to build a normal houses in this area. So the caves was uh, empty from people since many years. So it was totally destroyed by the settlers. So they don't be able to be used again by the Palestinians family. So the idea was to, uh, you know, restart these caves and clean it and work in it and uh, restore the lands and the stone wall, plant trees and make a life again in this village because it's really full empty from life. So uh, there was a big number of activists and big number of international activists, Palestinian activists and everyone who, who used to be there in that time. But after three months, for sorry, like a lot of activists who live abroad, like start to leave because they have to leave. And then there was me and my friends from the village around. There was like we decide to continue the different activity that we used to do to encourage these families to come back again. Because it's not easy to tell a family after more than 22 years to come and leave again after they kick them in a very violent way the settlers because there is extremist settlers who's living in the settlements around us they believe that the palestinians have no rights in this land so we have to kick them out as as much as we can so they try their best like to scare and um, 
attack and raids and arrested and do whatever they want to make the family leave the family isn't that time to leave so the family were really scared about their kids and about their themselves and they leave because they live in there without electricity without water without anything so so they they really leave so it was not easy to go and to speak to the family and make le, le, at least let them feel safe to come and live again in their caves in, in this time so we start in that time while everyone was leaving and we have to continue this idea because we bring a big attention after we make that camp. It was really known and big and uh, we collect a lot of people to work in this uh, camp and encourage a lot of people to be an activist and work and help. Uh, so if, if we leave just like this after three months, after we bring this big attention from the next hour, the settlers can go down and just, you know, uh, confiscate the place immediately. So we chose that as Youth of Sumud. We were really six people. We were at the beginning of the group was really really small. As a, also as a woman, as a, also a young girl was in that time. We were all school students. It was also a big uh, like decision for us to to take this step. But our like families were really believing on us that you can do, guys, and continue what you are planning want to do. So we really do that and we continue and we start to uh, bring international attention uh, through our relation that we know from uh, really different countries and places in the world. And we start also to uh, encourage more young people to be members of the group and be activists, even women or or men. So that was really important to even to resist this occupation in the non-violent way. We believe as youth of Sumud in the non-violent resistance. Uh, at the at first of all, because our old people used to uh, encourage us to resist, but in the non-violent resistance, because we are living under their control and they are the occupation. They are, they have the power. They are controlling our every single details in our day. So they they are they can do everything to stop you, even to go to work. They they have the power to raid your bedroom in the late hours in the night. So. They understand us that you, you can resist, but you have to be smart in your resistance because you don't want to stop your life. At the same time, you have to resist to find a way to let the, the world around understand what is happening here and what is the truth. Because Masafiriyata is one of the places, it's in the nowhere because no one know about us because we are all living in very single and small de- uh, villages. Uh, in between mountains in here in the really the most south area in the west bank we are extended mm-hmm. until the green line borders uh, the borders of 67 war so mm-hmm. even in the in palestine itself in uh, the west bank there is a lot of people don't know where is musafiriyata and what's happening in musafiriyata and this is one of the big really refusing thing that we were as youth of Samud refusing it because we were knowing that if no one know about us even our struggle will be hidden and no one know about what's going on here so what we have to do is just to take discover that the occupation is is even using because while everything is protecting and no one and in silent way they're attacking and uh, violated the human rights in Masafariyata our human rights as a as a civilians, we can say, because we are living here to defend our land, because we believe in our rights in this land. So we need the attention. We need to turn the light in all these crimes that's happening in Masafariyata. And it's on our children as youth people living in Masafariyata. So we have to work on ourselves before anything else. And here, the resistance is always leaded by the women. The women is always the first line in the resistance, because the woman who is at home, and who is living in caves and living without water and who is living without electricity. Here, the Palestinian woman is living without any really uh, like human needs. You know what I mean? I, I mean, now we are in 2022 while the world is following the modern technology and everyone is running about to be more modern. There is a Palestinian woman living in caves and tents because the occupation, the Israeli occupation, are not allowing them to have an, even one room to live in. They're living in caves 
you know what does it mean like 2022 and there's people still using the caves to protect themselves and to protect their children and they're all surrounded by settlements and extreme settlers that they are they really want to kick them out of this you can imagine with me that the 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 high level of fear that these kids and this woman living in but the women have no other choice they have to believe in themselves and they have to learn their children and their husbands and their sons and their brothers that this is our struggle and this is this is what we have to to make really the resistance be in our blood so here when the night raids happening for example when a big number of armies just raided your house at four in the morning or three in the morning who's accepting that it's the woman and the children because the woman who is at home a lot of men go to work and stay one week and more far away than their houses so when the attacks happening the first the first people who's facing that is the women and the children. So the women in Masafir Yatta, they are all in the front line and the first line and everything. So even to go a demonstration, always the woman is in the first line because a lot of time they focus to arrest and attack the the young men and the young uh, you know boys to uh, stop the movement of the of the family because mm-hmm. they think in the like uh, when they arrested the guys or the men so the house will be so weak because it's still still just women and kids so we can do whatever we want in the village because also the village is about few numbers of people you know it's also kind of of a strategy that they're using to make the people less and the men less so the woman can seem more weak and scared and don't ongoing in the resistance you know to give up and leave the place so really the what I mean about Palestinian women, I mean really this is steadfastness that they are living every day. I don't, I cannot imagine anywhere else in the world like any woman can live in this like hard level of violence and scared and fear. Because here in Masafir Yatta, because as I mentioned before, we are living in Syria under the full control of the Israeli occupation army. They, they separate this area for two areas. One is for the settlements and one for the military training. So we are living between these two in dangerous system of the Israeli occupation because the settlements is every day extending and being bigger and bigger and being more close for the Palestinian houses which is which is just caves and the other thing is the military training they are using our land to train their military so they are using their guns they're shooting their booms really around our houses so you are always hearing that last May the Israeli High Court gave us a decision to evict eight Palestinian villages from Masafir Yatta to use it for the military training. It's happening recently. So more one, more than 1,500 Palestinian will be refugees and homeless again. They are still steadfastness and, and really catch with their with their caves and lands because they don't have any other choices. Because if they if they be evicted in this year in 2022. They really will be homeless again. So last May until this moment, we are trying our best to bring a lot of diplomatic people, a lot of international people to come and see how. And they start already demolishing uh, separated houses and separating villages. And it was really scary for a lot of children and a lot of women because they started to, to ask themselves where we have to go, where where we supposed to go, because there is no other choice for them. So they will be homeless. It's another Nakba. The occupation is preparing to be happened in Masafir Yatta. And this is very big issue. It's happening in Masafir Yatta. And for sorry that it was not this attention that we need to happen and to stop this uh, to stop this high court order. Because if it's happened, it's really a catastrophe. We will lose eight villages. Land, it means it's going to be used for the settlements and for the military training. And already they start to bring their bulldozers and everything downstairs. So you can imagine with me uh, these children and this woman who go to to bed every night and they are really just supposed and imagining and accepting that any moment the bulldozers go down and demolition their houses and kick them out. So this is one of the fear that's always being in the minds and the hearts of these women and children. Mm. And this is the resistance of the Palestinian woman here. It's enough to be living in Masafir Yatta. It's it's self-resistance because when you are just staying in your house and taking care of your children and if you, because a lot of women here are shepherds because they are living the farmer lifestyle because they are taking care of sheep, taking care of land, grazing, planting trees and that's the, the, the lifestyle of the Palestinian woman in Masafir Yatta. 
but at the same time they know that their life is not uh, really safe because it's just also the shooting here are allowing they have the green line to shoot because it's also firing zone area there last year there was this guy who was Harun Abaram who was shooting in his neck from zero distance by one soldier because he was trying to protect the property from the army to don't be confiscated because he was trying to have a generator for his house it working it working for a few hours to have the light for his house just for a few hours you know and yeah. they they were trying to, they were confiscating it and he was trying to protect it and one soldier shot him in his neck and now he cannot move because the shooting was in his neck. So he was, I think, 25 years old, and now he's in bed forever. They kill him, but they, they don't kill, they kill his life, but they don't kill him. Like he's alive, but he is not alive anymore. He's still 25, he's still in the beginning of his age. He should just preparing for his life and future and studying and whatever, but here they killed his life in front of his eyes. So this is the, the you know, the oppression of the Israeli occupation against our people in the Safayata. My family, my own family, I, I was born in a family have a long history in the nonviolent resistance and they pay a very high price to be an activist. I have my grandma that she passed away last week for, for oh. sorry, I'm, and she was around 96, yeah, 96 years old. And she was leaving the first intifada, the second intifada, the first Nakba, the second Nakba. She she was refugees from 48. She lived a very hard life through her really experience to resist this occupation. She was evicted and she was refugees. She was kicked. She was attacked and she and they beat her. She was beating. She was really she was she came where I live right now in Twani village in Masafari but she came a refugees from 48 and she was resisting in this last point that she can wait to make a life for me and for for my father and for my mom and for my other brothers because my also my grandfather passed away really early and he leave her alone and she was respond about children she was respond about sheep and she was have no houses she came here and she built a stone house by her hand like she she just oh found goodness. a stone and she make a stone house by her hand and she leave and because she was having no choices there is no house yeah. to go for she found this empty land and she built this stone house and we still have it but it's so close for the settlement and they are refusing us even to you know to restore to restore it or to clean it or they are just it's, it's there but they are refusing us even to use it because it's so close to the settlement so she 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 resists until she 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 managed to you know sell her sheep and buy small land and then she built our house where we live now. So she was one of the big examples. She was like icon of the nonviolent resistance and she uh-huh. resists in this land. But she she live really. They beat her the settlers couples of time. They beat her the army couples of time. She lost one eyes and one ear. She was living in because of the beating. Once they were trying to arrest my father, who was the con- the coordinator of the nonviolent resistance South Hebron, because he's the he's the son of my grandma, so she was teaching him, you have to resist, you have to resist. So he was working in himself to be an activist. So he became an activist, and he was really organizing a demonstration and helping the people and bringing international people. He was a he was like studying in Bethlehem City, so he was go have a, a good English to to it help him. While they were having no service to help himself, but he traveled for another city and he learned English to to bring the the solidarity for his place. So he resist and so he was uh, like they they focus on him. So they was trying to arrest him. So she was helping my father to don't be arresting. So they beat her in her head and she lost one eyes and one ear and she was living really seeing in one eyes and one ear because they, she was attacked and targeting also by the occupation settlers and army until the last moment until the last street she was telling us please it's my message it's our resistance now it's your turn i'm so tired i'm passing away so it's your now it's your struggle so i'm here as samihan i'm with all of you today also 
to let you hear my voice from Masafria, to also to take the cover of the Israeli occupation operation in Masafria. But here something happens, it really don't happen in any where else in the world because the Israeli occupation is focusing to show for the social media and the TV the positive of what's happening here and I'm here to show you the truth because also our children who have to come to their school every day are also violated and attacked by the Israeli settlers and army. I'm speaking about an experience of these children that's happening every day in Masafir Yatta who are leaving behind the settlements they are so really separated, even the Masafir Yatta, and they have to, to walk every morning and every afternoon through the settlements to come to their school and go back. I'm speaking about eight, eight, eight years to 13 years, the oldest one. They're just kids and children, and they're really young to, to wake up every morning and walk through a settlement that's full of extreme settlers that they really don't want to see them there to go to their school and come back. A lot of children were attacked and hospitalized. A lot of children were arrested without reason. A lot of children were running after them with dogs, with dangerous dogs. A lot of them were throwing stone and, and really be hospitalized with stick. They follow them with cars, trying to kill them. These settlers are not really a human. They are just really focusing. They are children, okay? If they are Palestinian, yeah. they are not in an age they can understand that they, they know that they just they have to go to school. They don't understand even what does it mean occupation, what does it mean settler, what does it mean settlements. They're waking every morning. They are just going to their school and coming back. Even the right of education, that it's the simple right that it, the children have just to enjoy in all over the world. Here in Masafir Yata is violated and it's a big deal for the children. And you know, a lot of students stop come to school because of the fear that they are leaving every day to come and back from their school. This is, I think, I'm sure it's not happening anywhere else in the world. And this is a big thing that we are focusing as a youth of Samud and as an activist in Masafir Yatta to turn the light on, to let the world see what's happening. This is, these children, what is their fault in this life to come and live like this? These girls who was eight years old when, um, when settlers from Habat Ma'on settlements go out and beat her in the rocks and be hospitalized for one week and she she was really in a very dangerous what's her fault? She was just going to her school. Like we can ask ourselves as a human being also. Not, okay, forget Israel, Palestine, occupation and not it's a human being. Like she's not just an eight years old ch child and she's going to her school. What's her what's her fault? Just to be a Palestinian? Just to be a Palestinian child is going to their school and coming back. So this is the high level of oppression that the Israeli occupation is make in Masafir Yatta. And it's supporting them that no one is knowing about that. It's supporting them, the settlers and the army, to attack and keep going in violation and attacks and their crimes against our people in this place. I live in Twani. Twani have a master plan. Master plan means... We can build a house, we can have electricity, we can have water, but we are the only vi village we have these services because the like the people of Twani in 2010 and 2009 and in 2000, they were refusing what the occupation put on their children. They were asking the court, they were bringing attention, they were making a media attention, they were like asking uh, like diplomatic people, they were to, to have this master plan and they managed to get it for 30 dunum just like we cannot go out of the of the of the plan that they gave us. My house was half of it inside the master plan and half of it was out. Like they were like planning to, to demolish the half of our house. Like look how even your own house you're, you don't have the full freedom to feel safe and really we are living in Masafa Yatta right now. Even our bedroom, it's not safe for us because the army every night, three times per week, they enter and they just raided your bedroom to arrest someone. I have my brother, I have two brothers and my dad that they are, they are from the main people that are targeting by the Israeli settlers and army. And our house be raiding couples of times to arrest my brothers and my father. I have my brother Sammy that they try to kill him. We as a family, we live this trauma from these people because they are focusing to make us scared because they know that there is an activist in this family. We should scare them by 
trying to kill someone of this family. So my brother Sami, who is older than me, one year, he's really he's the coordinator also of, of Yusuf Samoud, and he's really known in Masafir Yatta as an activist. They two settlers in 2017 drive on him with a quad, and he was really lucky to survive in that time because it was a really big fear that we were living as a family that time. They drive on him, but he was lucky to jump in the last moment and they crashed his leg for two crashes and he was hospitalized and he was un- like one year suffering of that accident, accident from two settlers from Habat Ma'on. The second one, they tried to shoot him and he was lucky also to calm this shooting in his right leg. It was not on him. And the third, like they uh, raid our house when I mentioned Harun Abu Aram, when he was shooting, Sami was organizing an, a, a demonstration to ask justice for Harun. And he was organizing this and he bringing a lot of people to do a demonstration in the place where Harun was shooting because it's not something normal that you should, you should, you should a person and just leave. So he was asking a justice for Harun Abu Aram and also asking some people to help him to do a different surgery. and. They came in our house at three in the morning and they raid us and they arrested Sami for one week and they make him a court without a decision. And they were until this moment, Sami is suffering by this court and they don't have they don't give him a decision because they charge him in different, uh, you know, in different different reasons for his arresting. But he there is no proof on him. He was just organizing a demonstration. They said that he beat a soldier, he was in a place close to the settlements, but there is no proof on that. But until this moment, Sami is without a court decision. They ask him every time for, um, for a court and a court hearing, and with a lot of army came and uh, say that Sami do that and do that. But until this moment, Sami is not really complete his courts. And I have my brother Hamoudi that he is now 18 years old. He was arrested when he was 13 years old. He was arrested when he was 14 and when he was 15. He was really young to be arrested and they make him just suffering from arresting to scare him in that age that he was so young. So also press, they make a pressure on us that we, if you keep resist and do these things, he, and they were telling him in the interrogation in the police office, Hamoudi, if you keep going in, uh, in this area, if you keep going to Sarura, the village that, were, that we were working, we will arrest your mother, we will arrest your sister. So they were they were making with him. He was 13 years old. He was a child. He was not understanding what's going on. But they were scaring him of arresting us or attacking us or raiding our house. And once they came, they arrested the three of Sami and Hamoudi and my father. They arrested the three of them. And they start to make a pressure on three of them about each other. Like, Hamoudi, we arrested Sami. If you don't say that, we will keep him in jail. We arrested your father. So he go, they go for my father. And we, are, we arrested your both son. If you don't say that or do that. We, you know, this kind of a pressure that they do for a family and for a people to make them, like, more weak. This is what's happening for my own family. This is what's happening in my own house. I was living with my children, like, brother children. They are, like, two years old and uh, one is five years old. When the army raid my house, I see my brother, how they cry and scared from the army when they enter my house with this full, uh, you know, clothes and guns and sometimes with dogs and they're masking and they just wake you up in this early hour in the morning. So, you know, this kind of, of scary of the people and the children, how they feel when they see that. So we, I was growing up like my brothers in this way. I was so young when they used to raid my house. I was a child also when they read my bedroom and I see how they how they deal with my mom, how they push her, how they beat her, how they push my grandma, how they attack my father in front of us. You know this you know this trauma that they let you live in in this place. So this is like my experience. And I don't want to be so long, sorry for all of you, but this is like an example of what's going on here. Well, I think that your experience was very lucid and thank you so much for um, sharing that with us. I think it um, humanizes and also grounds our understanding of what's happening in Palestine. So thank you so much for that contribution. Um, Thank you so much for having me with you today here to give me your time to hear our story and our struggle. Thank you so much. No, and um, just know that you have a lot of support here in South Africa and we're doing 
whatever we can to help um, in the in the solidarity movement. Thanks, Amiha. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think Samiha touched on a lot of um, incredibly tragic but important points of the Israeli occupation. But something that stuck with me was her characterization and framing of women as the first line in resistance. Um, and I like this framing because she also said that for women in Palestine, activism isn't really a choice. Um, she also said that nonviolence is an important component of their activism. And so, um, Noor, I'd like to ask you a question on this, if that's okay. I think often when we think of progressive movements or when people think of um, social justice um, to the left of, of center, um, it's often described as radical. And often being radical is seen as something really bad. Um, however, I'd like to offer a different idea of radicalism, um, something that I think speaks to what a lot of people um, who are in South Africa and support Palestine believe in. Um, and so I'd like to refer everyone to Dr. Angela Davis's quote, where she said, being radical simply means to grasp things at the root. Um, another definition or understanding of radicalism is offered by Ian Pape in um, a book he recently edited of a collection of essays on uh, Palestine, where it said that to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair. And I'd like to know from you, Noor, um, do you think that the South African um, solidarity towards Palestine is radical? Um, do you agree with this framing? Do you think this framing is fair? And <clears throat> lastly, um, what, what is your take on the role of nonviolence in radicalism? Um, I'd, I'd like to start off with Noor, but Rosha and Kamalita, you're welcome to come in as well. Um, thank you. Uh, I, re I really like that quote by Dr. Angela Davis. Look, to, to, if it means to, be, to speak out against injustice, if that is what it means to be radical, then I guess we're all radical here. I think that sometimes the, the, the framing of it, the narrative is things are sort of framed as radical in order to deter people from being involved in specific movements. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to Palestine, it's um, been framed as something very controversial. And I always laugh when people tell me that they view BDS as like something really controversial. I'm like, since when? You know, when since when is boycotting and disinvestment and sanctions something that is um, controversial? And they would consider BDS as something that's radical. And I think Russian can touch more on this. Um, you know, BDS is not radical. BDS is something that helped us overcome apartheid um, South Africa, you know, and it's um, unfortunately that uh, the framing around these specific things, it's very intentional. They're framed as radical or they're framed as something that's controversial or like Palestine is seen as something that's, you know, people will say, oh, no, but it's like a very complicated issue. It's not a complicated issue. It's very much a case of apartheid. It's very much a case of settler colonialism. You have Israel, which is a state that has a lot of resources, that has a lot of power, has you know one of the best um, militaries in the world that they use um, against unarmed women and children. You know, mm -hmm. so if if it's radical for me to now as a woman speak out in solidarity against them doing that, then you know I guess um, all of us here. Um, radical. Um, what was the second part of your question? Sorry, the second part was um, when when Samiha spoke about um, her activism being nonviolent. Do you think it's yeah. possible to be nonviolent and radical? Definitely. I, I feel like there's different forms of activism, or there, there's different ways in which we can defy an oppressive system. And I don't think we should ever discount anybody's activism based off of, you know, maybe it doesn't align with our own values. I know that some people are very much um, into nonviolence, whereas other people um, say that, you know, violent um, resistance is, uh, it's really important and it's part of a resistant movement. And I think at the end of the day, we all need to keep in mind that 
we're all working towards the same goal. We might have different thoughts or ideas about something, but at the end of the day, uh, we are all working towards the liberation of Palestine. We're working towards um, eradicating oppressive systems globally. Um, and, you know, like I said, if uh, definitely people who are more conservative in their views would still consider someone who um, wants the liberation of Palestine, but is nonviolent in their, in their approach as radical. Um, and but if you just look at, you know, Dr. Angela Davis's um, definition of where she says that it's about um, grasping, I think it was um, to grasp things at the root, then, yeah, we, someone who is nonviolent is also still radical. Cool. Thanks, Nir. Um, Roshan, if I can just get your take um, on the response to BDS as a radical movement and, um whether or not you think that's harmed um, the traction for Palestinian support? Well, I think it depends, you know, it, who, who is using the word. As Noah was saying, I mean, if it's used as a way, uh, as an insult by the powers that be, then it's one thing. If it's used to describe taking action in solidarity, and I think it was really moving and important for us to hear the, the experiences of Samiha. And, you know, it really reminds of apartheid in South Africa, but in many ways I think is worse. And I think that level of violence and brutality and cruelty and the kind of resistance where just existing is resistance can never be underestimated. I mean, when you hear the day-to-day -day life that Samiha lives under and her brother Sami, who we spoke with um, in another meeting, I think it's, you know, it's very hard to see that solidarity with people who are living under that kind of oppressive apartheid colonial system could be considered radical in a pejorative sense. It's human, it's humane, it's, um, you know, that, that we should be in solidarity with people and that BDS is a tactic, which is a nonviolent tactic, I think is a very effective one. It is radical in the sense that it frightens the powers that be to the extent some countries are trying to legislate against it. Some academic institutions in the States are trying to legislate against it to make boycotting Israeli products and uh, companies illegal. I mean, I think they are quite scared of BDS. And I think in some ways, in some circumstances, nonviolent tactics are more threatening. And in the case of Israel, because their narrative is based on having this existential threat, and they always will use the fact, like the most recent attack on Gaza, where they claim that although nothing had happened, there was a threat that some that rockets would be fired or whatever it was by one of them armed groups, they get as an excuse to blitz uh, Gaza indiscriminately, killing children and people and wounding people, bombing a hospital. And in a way they need to, you know, they use that narrative to, to attack further. Whereas what they really can't stand is when people are not violent and they're simply refusing to subscribe to what they're being told to do, like the communities in Masafayata. And I think the strength there and the strength of the women there is unbelievable because they're just refusing and just saying, no, we're not doing this. We're not leaving. We're not going. In spite of the incredible threats and pressure and extreme violence um, meted out to them on a daily basis, like just children going to school, is, is a kind of a, a, a nightmare, just getting to the school. And in some ways that is more threatening. And I think that the narrative in Israel is way more scared of nonviolent or what they consider to be nonviolent resistance. So for instance, in uh, Sheikh Jarrah, when they had the iftar in the street, mm. they simply just had iftar in the street. It's more terrifying because it humanizes Palestinian people and it makes people feel, look, these are ordinary people. Why are they suffering like this? Why are people demolishing their houses? What's going on? Whereas if you start the narrative of Hamas and uh, Islamic Jihad and they're throwing rockets, it serves a purpose 
to create a narrative that tries to justify extreme repression and, and you know, unbelievably disproportionate response. So I think, you know, that that's, that different ways of resisting all have a place in a struggle. And, you know, to, to especially for us in the solidarity movement, to decide on one or other is ridiculous, as it was in our struggle. If when the people in the solidarity movement say, well, why aren't you doing this? The people should do that. They have no idea of the actual situations and circumstances on the ground, what people are doing, trying to do, how just existing often is resistance in itself. So I think that we should also bear that in mind. And I think, you know, testimonies and experiences shared by people like Samiha is, is invaluable for us to really understand better the, the actual realities of life in places like Masafayata and to raise up and make a noise even louder around what's going on and joining the dots between what's happening across Palestine, in Gaza, in Masafayata, in Jerusalem, within 48, that people on the ground aren't able to connect in real life because of all the different fragmentations and segregations and rules and regulations that are brutally enforced, meaningless apartheid-style segregatory laws. Um, so it's harder for them. So, for instance, in Masafayata, like Samir say, people don't know what's happening even in the rest of Palestine. And I think that's the role the Solidarity Movement can play by constantly raising up all of these issues and connecting them together to make the point that this is a brutal illegal apartheid state and therefore we need to push for BDS, we need to push our governments for sanctions because it was part of the struggle that helped us, not only directly impacting economically on and isolating uh, South Africa but also because it's a way of raising the issue, a way of creating a mass movement or mass movements around the world in solidarity and that in itself is an, is part of the solidarity we can give to people in struggle in Palestine. No, definitely. Um, thanks so much, Roshan. And to um, get Kamalita's input here, I think something that's important uh, in terms of connecting the dots, in terms of strengthening solidarity, is um, perhaps an appreciation for um, how settler colonialism change, uh, changed and fundamentally shifted um, patterns of privilege and wealth. Um, so Kamalita, I was wondering, as someone who's um, kind of studied um, the Fees Must Fall and Roads Must Fall movements, um, what kind of impact do you think the decolonial discourse has had um, on like South African consciousness? And can you perhaps give some insight as to why you don't think that's transferred to our sympathy for Palestine? To phrase my question slightly differently, because that's kind of confusing, it's um, in South Africa, we appreciate that uh, colonialism uh, is the cause of a lot of the issues that we face. Um, and so I'm just kind of curious as to uh, what you think the reasons are um, for us not wanting to appreciate um, the problem in Palestine right now, given the same kind of cause um, and how Fees must fall and roads must fall have highlighted that. Sorry, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I'm muted. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm uh, getting your your question correctly, but I'm gonna try to answer it. I mean, firstly, I think. You know, I don't think that South Africans are apathetic to the Palestinian question. I think that we have, you know, one of the biggest BDS movements um, in the world, really. And I think that there is, uh, you know, I think South Africans generally are aware of the Palestinian um, cause. And I think, uh, yeah, I think that there is a lot of things that happen around Palestine. And I mean, of course, even our you know, our ruling party and our trade unions, of course, they they pay a, a lot of lip service, let's say, to Palestine because, you know, in a sense, yes, the ANC supports Palestine, but, uh, you know, they still have all of these connections and the relationships with Israel, um, which is quite hypocritical. 
but in terms of the you know the rhetoric around it it's definitely there and i think in fact that is the that is the the point so you know, I used to also um, coordinate Israeli Apartheid Week at Rhodes University, and one of the, you know, one of the very interesting things, and this was quite a, a long time ago, like ten years ago or so, but you know, one of the interesting things was actually how people do realize the connection, and I think that how Palestine is actually used in South Africa as a kind of proxy war for people who haven't actually. Um, accepted that this is the the South African state is a settler colonial state and that it's a project that is very much like uh, Palestine and that they share uh, a certain history that they share certain modes and infrastructures of uh, governance and oppression with each other and I think that it is used um, in that way because when you see the pushback against the BDS here and when you see where it comes from and how that happens it is very much because of the way in which I think um, settler colonialism is founded on a global idea of you know, uh, uh, colonialism and, and racism at the end of the day. So I think, in fact, I would say no. I think what Feeds Must Fall and Roads Must Fall showed us is exactly what we see over the Palestine question, which is that these things are so unresolved in our own society. So the people who support Palestine and the people who don't in South Africa are also the people who are unwilling to see um, what our own history of settler colonialism is and what our own you know, legacies of that that continue to stay with us today. Um, and I will say one more thing, which is that, in fact, I think it's very important that we still maintain that Palestine is about settler colonialism, because I think what also happens in South Africa is that sometimes it gets played into this narrative that it's a religious issue, you know, and that is exactly what uh, kind of obfuscates this whole reality around Israel and Palestine, as if it's really about Jews or Muslims, which it's not, you know, and that's kind of what feeds into this Zionist propaganda. So I think even in South Africa, people who make it about religion, whether for good or for bad, um, in a sense, are actually missing the point that this is about um, colonialism, this is about land, this is about them wanting to ethnically cleanse Palestinians and take their land. And that is what's going on. And exactly we heard from Samia, this is, you know, this is an ongoing process. Uh, it's continuing today. And um, yeah, and, and that's the that's the major point of it, you know. Thanks so much. Um, Samia, I have one last question for you, um, if that's all right. Um, can you hear me? OK, I'm going to assume that Samia is not with us anymore. Um, but I think it would have been interesting to get a Palestinian perspective on the fragmentation of um, Palestine. So um, the most immediate example that comes to mind is the fragmentation of South Africa through the Bantu stance and how the creation of independent sort of states led to um, like the decentralization of our resistance and why or, and how that could have been problematic in a lot of ways. Um, but I think she has left the meeting. OK, that's fine. Um, just to round up tonight's discussion, because I think it was um, very enlightening in a lot of ways, I would like to ask our panelists if they have um, any like South African or Palestinian um, women activists that they particularly look up to and how um, they see themselves as contributing to the struggle. Um, it doesn't have to be like the Palestinian struggle necessarily, but I think just um, it would be really cool and insightful for our listeners to gauge um, to gauge that. So I'm not sure who would like to start. Roshan, would you start us off, please? <laughs> 
So the first part was uh, women who've inspired us in both places. Well, I think when I was young, I was super inspired by Leila Khalid because she just symbolized the fact that women could do anything. <laughs> and in the cause of, in you know, in support of a just cause. Um, and the image of her was, was so, you know, like amazing <laughs> as a young woman. <laughs> but now I would say also women like Samiha and like her grandmother. I mean, she lived through the entire history of, of, the, of the occupation from the original Nakba uh, and continued up until her dying day to encourage her children and her grandchildren to continue that resistance. And the story she told, you know, I think all the women that we don't hear about and in our own struggle as well. I mean, as you said at the beginning, then there are a few well-known women, but the other one I would mention is my mum, who was part of our struggle, but is not a, she wasn't a, a sort of a well-known or a political, in the political leadership, but she was, since a young woman, joined the struggle, was imprisoned in Con Hill now, the women's jail, detained without trial, then went into exile and never was able to come back again, left everybody. She never left the country before and suddenly was had to make a life somewhere else. And I think she didn't consider herself a feminist. She used to argue with me when I was young and very feisty and feministy. <laughs> um, but, you know, women like her and her mates, many of whom's husbands are known as people in the struggle, but in fact, it was the, the women that were also part of the struggle that no one really acknowledges or talks about. And then the, the millions of women in South Africa. When I was young, I remember the women in Crossroads um, that, is, that were, were fighting the police in Crossroads uh, informal settlement and refusing to leave. And that was very inspiring. It was hard to get news then of what was going on here, especially then later when they were in the state of emergency, there were news blackouts and there wasn't the internet and phones were tapped. And so there were particular images that you thought, wow, that's what's going on. And it was so powerful to see women fighting to keep, as Samir was saying, in a sense, fighting to keep their homes, to make their homes when they had none, to refuse to leave the city of Cape Town. Um, so I think a lot of unsung women need to be sung about in our struggle and in Palestine. No, definitely. Um, I think that's a really good point that you make there about um, the celebration of women as well. So I think um, one of our aims of this evening was not only to highlight the role that they play in resistance, but also to appreciate that role. Um, I mean, a lot of the time they're just forced there by choice. And so um, Th thank you for sharing um, those anecdotes with us. I think it really does kind of cement um, like the, the tone of the evening. Um, Noor, um, what, what kind of uh, activists inspire you um, and your role in the struggle? Um, honestly, I think women in general inspire me. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that women are just absolutely amazing. Um, you know, whatever they do, it's the the strength and the resilience that women possess, and it's astounding. Um, you know, we continue to exist in a society that is not always geared towards our interests and our safety, but you know, we still persevere and we take up space and we continuously fight against the systems that aim to oppress and control us. Um, uh, you know, it's no secret that uh, our society is upheld and like it's held together by women. Um, you know, it's what um, Samia said about her her grandmother being involved in the it, it was an activist, and you know she is as well. And you know, it's about Russian Russian's mother who was so incredibly involved. And you know, I I, can, I I bet you these women were going to like protests and demonstrations during the day and coming back home and cooking dinner for the kids at night. You know. So they were doing it all. And I think that to me is incredibly inspiring. And as a young woman, um, I find that so inspiring and that these incredibly powerful women have paved the way for us, for you know, you and myself to now be able to live in a, in a democratic, free 
society, you know, and, and, and like you said, a lot of the times it's, and, and Russian reiterated, a lot of the times these women's um, names and their voices are not really amplified. Um, they're kind of are seen as like the the hidden part of the resistance, you know, um, where we spoke about Nelson Mandela and all these other male activists, but and who went to jail. But I think um, people forget that women were also jailed um, during the You know, they were also um, fighting along with their male counterparts. So why is it that sometimes their role is sort of glossed over? Um, so I think for me, I especially gained strength from the amazing women who came before us, who um, paved the way for us to be able to sit here and and sort of, in a way, have the luxury to chat about, um, you know, the role that women play. Um, but I also feel like a lot of the times I, I'm especially inspired by the women who might not necessarily be um, big names out there, but they are still incredibly involved in um, sort of the grassroots organizing and the community level work that they're doing, uh, women that I meet on a day-to-day -day basis and the work that I do, um, who who do it very quietly. You know, there's no, like, there's no accolades or there's no sort of um, big names attached or big awards, but they do the work because they know the work needs to be done. Um, and they do it and they get things done. And I think that to me is very, very inspiring. Um, and as a young activist, you know, um, I'm incredibly inspired by all of these women in the past and in the, in the present women like Russian as well, who, um, you know, is in the movement. There's so many people that I could name who are doing such incredible work. So, Definitely. Thanks. I think something that really um, stuck out for me in what you said was how we have the privilege to be here talking about this because of the path that they paved. Um, and when Roshan said that um, the image that sticks in her mind is like these women powerfully resisting against, you know, the apartheid police, um, because I immediately think of the 2019 gender based violence protests where um, it wasn't just women who had taken to the streets. It was queer women, trans women, black women. Um, who had led um, and often, in, in my mind, changed the discourse around how we see empowerment. So I think you're definitely uh, right in that we need to find strength in these everyday uh, kind of resistances. Yeah, um, I think also thanks, you know, to end off, I think it's also while we find strength in these women, we also need to now recognize our roles that we play as young women in our society now. And, you know, if we do have spaces like these where we're able to amplify voices, it's now our duty and our role to ensure that um, we make these spaces safe spaces for all people and that we also um, aids in the sort of amplifying amplification process of different types of voices to be at the forefront so I think that while we do gain strength from these women and you know we, we get an example for them and there are role models I think we also need to um, look at how we can take that example and set example for women or people um, in general who come after us. Oh no definitely um, thank you for that. And I think that's particularly um, relevant in the Palestinian discourse, where often we speak about Palestine and we impose our own ideas of what should happen and what the answer to the Palestine question is, um, instead of just um, amplifying the voices that already do exist. So thanks for that. Um, Kamalita, um, given that you're not someone who's so-called part of the Palestinian resistance right now, do you um, have any South African or even Palestinian women that you look up to? Um, yeah, so I think, you know, I feel quite in the same spirit as the last two speakers. I think that, you know, the more and especially, you know, what Roshan was saying, of course, we all wanted to be Leila Khaled at some point in our lives, you know, carrying the garden wearing the kefir or Winnie Mandela um, and these strong, uh, powerful women as we know them. But I think um, absolutely, like once you start reading more and once you start engaging more, um, and you start realizing exactly these things about, you know, uh, why women are silenced and how we don't actually see all of these things. And I think that's because this 
kind of obsession with like the names and um you know and and these exemplary figures i think it is a very much a fetishization of male leadership and i think it comes from particular modes of organizing i think it comes from a particular forms of recognizing leadership that are uh, very patriarchal. So I feel like even with women, and you know, you spoke about the 2019 March and what was quite incredible about that and about uh, women organizing in communities or even the 1956 marches is that, you know, you still can't point to a kind of executive that plans everything or these you know, you of course we know the woman who kind of handed the memorandum over in the 1956 anti-pass march, but they were the ones who, in in a sense, handed this memorandum over, but never really took credit for organizing or uh, the 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 march or put themselves forward as these kind of leaders. And I think you know the more I kind of work with women's movements and look at the ways women organize, this. You know, I think this is what Nuru was saying as well. Like they just do the work, and and they do it uh, collaboratively. And this is not because they are like uh, innately just these angelic people. I think it's also because of the way in which women are socialized, and the way in which men are socialized in patriarchal society, which is to be these, you know, hyper individuals who have solutions for everything and who, who you know, need to be decisive and needs to be leaders and. And I think that women are socialized kind of differently and that actually makes them organize differently and think differently about politics. So I think that, yeah, I would say, you know, when we when we look at, you know, women broadly today, that's often um, what happens. And I think they often, in fact, don't take the credit for a lot of the work that they do. Um, and which is not even often recognized as work or organizing work in that sense. Uh, but to at the risk of you know going against everything that I just said, it's also uh, it's also the death day today of a very famous Palestinian woman called uh, Matia Moganam, who actually was. Um, uh, in the 1920s was one of the founders of the Palestinian women's movement as well. So I thought I should just mention that because it is her death day. So we don't forget her. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good timing. Um, thanks so much, Saka. I think that you actually are very poignant in pointing out that um, the persecution of the patriarchy isn't aimed towards women. It's aimed at persecuting femininity. And that's why when we think of things like gender-based violence, things like um, gender inequality, it's not men versus women. It's not this heteronormative um, idea. And so I think that you um, nicely kind of capture the role that socialization plays in um, our, our kind of reward system. So, yeah, I just want to say that it's been such a privilege to um, host the three of you. It's been such a valuable contribution and the SUPSF is forever in your debt um, and incredibly humbled and inspired by the work that all three of you do. So thank you so much for taking the time out with us. Um, in Samia's absence, I think that she had made an incredible contribution tonight, just hearing about her lived experience in the occupation wasn't just sobering, but I think um, it humanizes the, these kinds of conversations where it's very nice for us to have an abstract sort of intellectual uh, discussion on certain things, but really for that discussion to be grounded in um, the fact that Samia couldn't join for the first half of the meeting because she's literally living in a settlement, I think changes the scope of, of our conversation a lot. So in her absence um really it was it was invaluable and i think we really appreciate that um to everyone who joined the meeting thank you so much um this will this will be available on our youtube channel um so yeah we'll send the link for that and have a lovely women's month uh, and in in the women's month i would strongly encourage you to appreciate the resilience of women um and perhaps read some cool feminist literature. Thanks, everyone.